really excited for our next session titled The Opportunity of Data Science, uh, Data Centric AI in Insurance, brought to us by a former DJ, a lecturer at Columbia University, and managing director at Marsh. Please welcome to the stage, man of many talents, Alejandro Zarate Santanova. Santovena, sorry. <laughs> welcome, Alejandro. Hello, thank you. Thank you for I having know. me today. Of course, I didn't know you were a DJ for almost a decade, so that's really cool to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a DJ for many years, yes. That's awesome. something I really enjoyed, yeah. <laughs> well, over to you. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Let me share my screen so we can, we can go into the topic. So what I will be talking about today is about the opportunity of data-centric AI in commercial insurance. Uh, let me clarify that. Uh, many of the perspectives I will be giving today is a perspective from my current position. I'm currently managing director of Marshall McLennan, and I'm heavily involved in the development of technology uh, around a brokerage, insurance brokerage. And I am also um, uh, part of the faculty of the Master's in Insurance Management at Columbia University. So let's start. So obviously, um, I think we will, we many of us will agree here that the need, the need for AI adoption insurance is is an imperative. I mean, probably many of you are not involved in insurance, but those who we are in the industry, we are seeing more and more that AI adoption is becoming an imperative, right? Not only because obviously we have a increasing demand for quick and easy insights, right, uh, and also because democratization is accelerating. Right. We see more and more availability of, 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 uh, of insights. Uh, users are becoming more and more used to, uh, to use data in, in their decision making. Um, BI solutions and dashboards and data visualization has become extremely common in the industry. So we will see more and more that people is getting more and more used to the use of um, uh, data in their decision making. And obviously, uh, AI can support this democratization. Right now, I, something I think that really triggered um, this consciousness on this need to start to think about artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, was ChatGPT, and I think that this is happening in all industries somehow. Right, ChatGPT, in a way, is helping us to open our eyes to what artificial intelligence can do for us. Right, and and also. The fact that we can find artificial intelligence not only in ChatGPT, but also we can find it in Amazon, we can have, have find it in Netflix, we can also find uh, AI in all aspects of, of our life. Uh, as probably many of you have heard, AI is becoming like electricity, right? And will be everywhere. It's, it's a general purpose technology and we will find it everywhere. In the specific case of insurance, uh, we can see very quick use cases in analytics, obviously, in claims processing, claims analytics, underwriting, product detection, and obviously to improve customer experience. Now, how insurers can compete in the age of AI? And, and this is a very important question because something we have seen through the years, and especially when we talk, let's call it non insured tech companies or the more traditional insurers, uh, have found a lot of challenges to adopt new technologies. Today, I think we have no options. I think we are in a point in which we need to face this challenge and we really need to start to look uh, how to leverage these technologies and then make much better use of them. Um, I see three, three potential, or, or I see three ways in which uh, insurers and, and, and the insurance industry can leverage AI. The first one, and I think the most obvious is improving operational effectiveness, right? Like stuff like data extraction or claims processing, underwriting, all of this kind of stuff is very related to how to improve operational effectiveness. And that's where I see a lot of the opportunities uh, or the immediate use cases that we will see uh, in the use of AI, right? Uh, policy ingestion, uh, policy comparison, how we can extract data from forms, a lot of the stuff will be really, or none of the applications and use cases will be related, how we can improve operational effectiveness. Now, there is another key aspect that is, but 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 beyond that, I think 
enabling new business model is where we can really leverage this, right? Uh, what I'm talking about here, well, new ways to do business, right? When we look at issue techs, many of them are uh, trying to innovate and they are trying to develop new business models around uh, AI. I think um, uh, Lemonade is one of the best examples in which uh, this new breed, let's say, of entrepreneurs in the insurance markets are trying to to use AI and develop business models. I personally believe that this is still in, 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 in its infancy, and we will start to see more and more people leveraging um, the use of AI to enable new business models. And that's where I see the growth of AI in the industry. There is another op there is also another imperative, I would say, uh, in which the insurance industry and most important, let's say the traditional or legacy players in the industry uh, need to look at and is identify new partnership opportunities. And I'm speaking particularly around insurtech. I think one of the key aspects and advantages that most of legacy, legacy players have is the customer ownership. And, and but they lack in many cases the technology, the technology knowledge and, and skill. Uh, I think this will be this is a required is a required step in order to really um, adopt uh, AI in the insurance, right? Um, Insurance, I think, is really particular in the sense that customer ownership is, is a key key factor uh, to, um, to be successful. And some disruptive models many times play around the concept of cost and how you can create efficiencies. But that is an aspect that, in many cases, is not enough to really disrupt the industry. I think anyone trying to compete in this market, trying to disrupt me to recognize that or customer ownership at human level, it will be very important. And for that partnerships and investment is very important. So what do I see as the key challenges on AI adoption, especially for legacy insurers or brokers? I think one of the first one is data engineering is one of the key things I see in my professional practice in general. And I see also in my, in my academic experience talking with many people around the topic. And I think one of the key issues is related because uh, to the fact that today data engineering in many organizations is, is concentrated how we can enable operations or reporting, right? And, and this is a key aspect because in, in this way, we are just providing analytics related to the past behavior or the past achievements of the company. I think that's that's one of the key things, right? Data engineering is really, really concentrated around reporting and all the concept around data and how we aggregate data is concentrated around reporting. The second point has to do a lot with data acquisition. See how we acquire the data and how we how we how we define this data, right? Today something we saw also a lot is we focus mainly on the transaction. We record the transaction, right? Like which, which, what client, which line of business was bound, right? And I think that is a big, big difference when we are trying to apply AI and we want to try to do more predictive analytics into the business that this is not enough. Just to record the transaction is not enough. We will need to start to think more in terms of the interaction and the way our, um, let's say, our business partners of our clients um, uh, behave. I will present an example in a couple of minutes. Data quality, another key aspect, and I think will gain more and more importance uh, with time, especially if we want to really leverage uh, more sophisticated uh, AI, let's say, alternatives such as large language models, and especially companies who want to embark into developing foundational models uh, for any application, data quality will be essential and then will become really, really important. But today is, is a big, big challenge. Another industry challenge that I see is has to do with the manual processing. We today in the industry have an incredible amount of manual processes from uh, onboarding clients to providing the policies, 
how we process the submission, how, how we execute the submission process. So we still have a lot, a lot uh, of challenges around that. I think it's probably one of the most important. And, and I think this will be solved uh, little by little as we achieve more operational effectiveness and as we incorporate more automated tools into, the, into our processes. And finally, because we're talking about data-centric AI, of course, something we have seen and I have seen in my practice is this model centricity that is, is really common when we, uh, when we want to contrast and differentiate from, from data-centric, uh, from a data-centric approach, right? Today, we still see that uh, um, is more emphasis is put into the model, into developing models that yield certain or acceptable levels of performance without not really questioning uh, the data as much as we should, right? What are the use cases I see? And very, and I think all of these cases uh, will be depend heavily on having a data centric approach. First of all is what we call risk capacity matching, which is, is a concept I will explain in a moment, but basically is how I can match a kind of risk appetite with a risk, right? Who I know, who are, who is the best market uh, for a specific risk, and I will I will try to explain it with an example in a few minutes. Benchmarking is another key aspect, especially in brokerage in our industry. Brokerage is an extremely important uh, aspect when we approach and part of our value proposition, and also AI can help us tremendously to do this in a much better and much more structured of uh, way and to deliver more value to customers. Claims classification or claims processing in general, I think has uh, a really good opportunity uh, in general for the industry. Uh, we recently conducted research about this specific topic of claims classification. We evaluated um, large language models in order to improve the way we classify claims in which in many cases, in many companies still done by hand, right? And how we can leverage the power of uh, large language models to execute and simplify this process. And here is a key, this is a key aspect also for, for data quality and to have a data centric approach, particularly because many times when, if we want to perform some of these tasks, we will need to fine tune uh, large language models like GPT-3 or BART, uh, uh, sorry, or BERT, and we will have to fine tune these models. And in order to fine tune these models, and in order to get the actual output we are looking for, will require a data-centric approach. Another possibility is that are also very highly dependent on the, uh, on, on the kind of data and the data quality we can provide uh, is rider assistance. We see a lot of opportunities, for example, to assist, again, our brokers or our claims handlers or our TPAs to write loss descriptions, right? So that can be another very good way to leverage new, uh, new technologies, including large language models, right? Also, we can help our, our brokers or our undergraduates to work clauses, right? On even to evaluate clauses. Is this clause a good quality clause? Is, is, is considered good? It will, uh, it's aligned with what we're trying to achieve. This is the kind of stuff that can help. In the same way with endorsements, right? We can help us also to identify and to recommend us the right endorsements for the specific kind of business we are trying to own the right. And finally, uh, policy ingestion and summarization, another very good, uh, another very good um, use case, probably not so dependent on, on model fine tuning, but still very relevant in the, uh, in the field of the, uh, when we are talking about uh, commercial insurance. Now, let me try to exemplify some of the concepts I have been discussing and, and, and try to give you some perspective. So when we talk about uh, risk capacity matching, and, and this is a project we conducted a few years ago, we, we even got a patent for this. Um, it's very interesting because basically what we were trying to do, or the big question we're trying to answer is, okay, how can I identify the best market for a risk? And many times, the best market is not necessarily the market that is actually binding those risks, but the one that is actually coding on, and, and is bringing more value to, right? 
And that's where I think I can see uh, the, big, the, the big opportunity and the relevance of a data-centric AI. Let me quickly explain the model. Normally what you would do in, in a model like this and what we were doing is to say, okay, I have a client which has certain characteristics, right? It may be involved in an industry, it may have a specific kind of size uh, or revenue, it will have certain values, we will have certain interest in certain level of retention, and I can create a profile of that of that client. Okay, something I can do is can just go back and look to all my data uh, and, and to look at my transactional data and simply just try to figure out which carriers have bound this kind of business, right? Now, it's something you will find because uh, as, as, as insurance is a very consolidated market is that you may, may probably always find the same names, right? And, and, and that doesn't help much if you're just surfacing those transactions in which this kind of business has been bound, you are not given the big picture, right? And that is what has been the typical approach for many years. Because basically we are matching who has written the business and not who is interested to get the business, right? So, so in that sense, these are the two steps. We are trying to find my client, I try to match somehow, and then I try to bring back a list of carriers that have risk capital. Now, when we look to risk appetite, which is uh, the kind of the kind of business that a carrier wants to buy, if we look only from the trans transaction point of view, we will say, okay, I'm looking only who has bound the account, and instead of looking to the activity, and then, and this is the concept that we we change in terms to become more data centric and to become really um, to to bring a more holistic view around the transaction. So when, when you are trying to place a business in the insurance market, you can either get a quote, you can get a declination, which is carrier is not interested to, uh, to even to quote the, the, the business, or you can get a no response, right? So in this sense, when we start to move just from transactions in which we only look to those who bound, and then we start to look to who actually quoted, who actually declined the, the, to quote, or who didn't respond, we can be, get a much better view of who are, what is the risk appetite of, of carriers. Carriers may have very big uh, book of business in, in lines and industry, they are not interested to grow, right? So if, if I try to apply a recommendation engine like the one I have here, only based on what is bound, I will be misleading my users in the, in, from the point of view that I'm not really showing who are those guys who may be quoting, who are not probably winning for any reason, or they are just too new in the market in order to have a significant amount or a significant participation in the bound um, in the bound accounts, right? So, so these are kind of the things that we are trying to bring. And when we are trying to change the concept of data, when we are talking about commercial insurance, and this is a data centric approach in the sense that we are looking to the activity and we are focusing on really making sure that all the data capture activity, uh, all the data capture captures the activity that we have in the real world when we are trying to bring a risk to the market. So what to expect and what I see in the, just to close, my my presentation what we should expect in the insurance market in the future right i think the most relevant change we will see in the coming years and and, and we will see especially among uh, legacy companies uh, of all sizes from agencies um, big agencies brokers and probably many insurers mgas is that the data acquisition process will have to change and will have to change because Otherwise, it would be very hard to provide the kind of insight that we need to be successful in the future and to be able to provide the experience we want for our clients, right? So the data design and engineer certainly will, will be changing. I think we will be moving away from this transactional approach, just keeping a ledger and record of transactions to really move into a more holistic approach and starting to aggregate uh, interaction to look more into the interaction and the activity. Um, number two, workflows. I think we will start to see much more uh, data acquisition integrated in the business workflows. That's something we see today. 
and as I said before, international activities. Uh, I have a couple of, I have a question here. I will answer in a minute uh, from Alexi. Um, data augmentation. I think this is another key aspect because again, uh, in legacy industries, as we have a very strong, uh, let's say, uh, we're very concentrated in, into record keeping and to, in, in just recording uh, bound accounts, if you want, or, uh, or transactions. Uh, we will start to see more and more data augmentation with other data sets that are not necessarily part of the submission or the, or, or, or the subscription process. As part of this, of this, reduced reliance also on manual processes, I see very strong, very strong trend in terms of um, the reduction of manual processes and the incorporation of workflows that we should allow better data acquisition. Uh, I see also an expansion of the data quality function uh, more and more and more. And I think this is, this is a very positive evolution we've seen in the last 10 years, how the data quality function is really taking more importance. And now it's becoming a more integral part of the data engineering uh, function. So, so it's another part that is, is, is extremely, I'm extremely optimistic about the role and how they will contribute to the industry. And finally, something that I think we, it's, 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 it's an imperative to have for anyone and any insurer or broker really trying to leverage, especially large language models or, sophistic, or more sophisticated approaches to, uh, to artificial intelligence is that asset curation. We will need to start to develop our own data sets very specific to the insurance industry. Today, obviously you see uh, data, very good data sets around computer vision, or you can say general sets to train language models. But today the industry has not really been capable to develop, uh, um, let's say data sets that can be used in the development of products uh, and the curation of data sets for artificial intelligence in the industry. I see a great, great opportunity there. To give an example, very simple. Uh, if today you're capable to aggregate just clause, let's imagine this, clauses just related to car insurance for a very simple case. <laughs> you're capable to create a database and you can create a training set of car insurance clauses. You can actually train large language models to assist companies in develop and to better understand um, how cars are insured today. And obviously you can generate insight about trends and, and, and you can get much better understanding how they, what, in what direction the industry is heading, right? But anyway, with this, I want to close my, my participation. I know we didn't have much time and I will be happy to answer any questions. And I think- uh -huh. No, I was going to say, thank you so much. So such a great talk, giving the audience a behind the scenes view and a very real use case um, around insurance. So thank you. Um, I, I think you were about to answer Alexi's question, but I'll just read it out loud. Um, so Alexi asks, how do you handle bias issues uh, when developing these machine learning systems? So let me explain. In the case, in the specific case of, of this recommendation engine I was presenting, let me go back here, right? Basically, the way, the way we try to, to manage bias is, um, first of all, looking not only to the bound, Karen, right? If, 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 and he was really trying to understand the activity around the placement process. If I were just to take only the bound accounts, I will be just by, I will be biasing, strongly biasing the model results to, um, to only those carriers that traditionally write this business, right? Now, something that is important to, to mention is that obviously bias will be always there because even when our brokers bound or go to markets and try to find markets to place business, they will go to the markets they know or the market that traditionally have bound these this risks. So what we try to do with this new let's say with this new uh, approach to identify carriers, it was to reduce the, in the bias that all, all our brokers already have when looking to the market, right? So, so I think the way for us, the way to, to manage bias in this specific case 
was looking not only to the bound carriers, but also to look to those who quote, those who decline, and those who didn't respond. Makes sense. That's a good point where humans also have bias. And so in this case, you're actively trying to make it such that the machine learning model doesn't have the same bias that maybe humans do. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, so that's at time for our session, but Alejandro, you'll be on Slack later. Yes, if people have more questions, I can see there's more follow-up questions in the chat. So I encourage you to uh, please post it in the chat, uh, Slack channel under the quest stage and Alejandro will be able to take a look there um, and answer your questions. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much.